welcome back to the 65 Summit 2025. We are here in the semiconductor track. We've got a great spotlight session. Excited to have you join me here. I have Chris Koopmans back for another conversation with Marvell. How are you doing today, Chris? I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, it's it's been a, a rush the last couple of years. You know, this show, Chris, is AI Unleashed. And, you know, you've been a keynote for us a few different times. I enjoy every year sitting down with you. Um, I'm just thinking about the last couple of years, how the conversation has progressed. Marvell has been moving along in the space, but you know, where I'd love to start this conversation is just a little bit of your general observations on sort of how the AI market is moving. You're in it in so many different ways. Sure. Um, so why don't, we, why don't we start there? AI Unleashed is a perfect uh, title because it is, it's unlike anything I've ever seen in my career. Um, every time we think, wow, this thing is huge and it's, can it really grow that fast from this point into the future? And then if you fast forward any time period, one quarter, one year, we look at it, we go, it was faster. <laughs> and then you ask yourself the question again, can it continue to grow this fast? And it's evolving really, really quickly. Um, we're just seeing the levels of data center CapEx spend um, just un unbelievable. And the amount of interest and desire for both for much of our solutions, both high-speed connectivity and building out custom AI infrastructure platforms, the opportunity set just continues to explode. So it's truly an exciting time to be in the infrastructure space. Yeah, and, and your business did really make a significant pivot. And you were one of the companies that came out early and really were able to be declarative in sort of how AI was impacting your right. business. But I can't really let this conversation go too long without talking about the XPU space. Sure. There is, Chris, so much excitement about, you know, the custom silicon. We've seen hundreds of billions of TAM added in the AI chip space. Um, we think the next frontier is going to be custom, um, the hyperscalers, but beyond. Talk a little bit about kind of how sure. AI factories, you know, that's a term that gets used a lot. How do you see these kind of emerging and being built in the future? Sure. How does Marvell see that? Yeah, so, so first of all, um, you know, the first waves of build out in AI infrastructure really were with the big hyperscalers, the ones that already had huge data center footprints and were able to very quickly mobilize and build out AI infrastructure within their footprints. And of course, secure and, and build out new data centers and new infrastructure. And that was, you know, starts with the top four US, but also around the world. Um, going forward, though, we're seeing, you know, we'll call them emerging hyperscalers. Like, who do we call a hyperscaler in 2028? I actually think there's going to be new names on that on that list because you see all these new kinds of companies that either either the model owners and builders, the application owners and builders, um, and then the rise of sovereign AI. You're starting to see just an explosion in all of these new areas as well, and and ultimately they're all looking for this AI infrastructure. And you you know you mentioned sort of the XPU side of things, you know, at Marvell, we have kind of, I'll just call it two halves of the AI business. There's the interconnect, no matter whether you have a GPU or an XPU, any of those things, even CPUs, they all need to be connected with really high speed. This business has grown so fast over the last several years because it's attached to every single one of them. Every system that's being built and delivered by every data center operator in every AI space in the world is using Marvell interconnect technology, the high-speed DSPs. And so the, the, the way that that has grown has been truly remarkable. While at the same time, we've built out this custom business that, that you talked about where we're seeing an explosion of a desire to build their own AI infrastructure optimized for their own sets of applications. So if you think about what I just mentioned, the hyperscalers are do, for doing what they're trying to do and build out their application and workloads and win part of this space with cloud, the model owners can build optimized infrastructure for their application. The application owners are building out um, AI infrastructure optimized for their applications. And so that's actually the custom opportunity continues to get bigger every time we look at it. And in fact, in 2021, we sat in this room and I annou we announced, Matt, our CEO announced that Marvell was entering into what we call the cloud optimized silicon business or the custom silicon business. Most people looked at us like, why would they build custom silicon? Well, nobody's asking that question anymore. Everybody's building custom silicon, and, and, and it's and it goes beyond just the XPU. Yeah, and, and, and that's a good leading question. And, and by the way, you were early, you were right. You know, got to give you credit where credit's due. Um, and I don't think everyone saw it right away, right. but I do think when you kind of look at how this is emerging, right? There's kind of these two schools. There's kind of you know the merchant silicon school. But if you look at, and by the way, the way you talked about hyperscalers, I think that is really interesting. And I'm glad you brought sovereign into this because 
I even think of things like service providers becoming hyperscalers. Right. I look at how in different regions are you going to address sovereign cloud in Portugal. It's probably going to be some partnership with a cloud and a, and a, and a, and a telco company and trying to, you know, that's got that regional expertise. So much going on, Chris. But the platform isn't just XP. It's not just compute. Right. What are the kind of, talk a little bit about what the platforms sure. look like beyond just the, you know, fighting for those, you know, those custom AI chips. Sure. So if you think about the space, um, one XPU GPU doesn't is not good enough for anything. You can't build the application to fit into one XPU or GPU. So you have to string together thousands, tens of thousands of them. Um, and so that means we fundamentally have a connectivity problem. How do you actually build these at data center scale? And so ultimately what that really means is there's a platform around them. You know, if you, if you start with the basics of an XPU, the best thing you can do is pack as many transistors as you possibly can into one reticle sized die. Not enough. So then you go with advanced packaging, and Marvell's made numerous announcements on this subject over the past few months. Then you package multiple of these die together with high bandwidth memory into a single package. Then you want to put as many of those on a board as you can, put as many of those in a rack as you can, put as many racks in a data center as you can, and connect all of them with as much bandwidth and connectivity as you can to really build out a logical XPU, if you will, out of multiple um, smaller components. And so ultimately, the way that that is done tends to be tied very closely to the architecture. So if you built a custom XPU, you probably have a custom platform. Uh, you're not just using a standard off-the-shelf platform. Now, that is a change. You know, when, if you first, if the, when this first started, you probably did. Just put it into a standard like x86 infrastructure with a top of rack switch that was running Ethernet and all of these other pieces. But that, that infrastructure moves at a much slower pace. Um, and so what you're seeing now is an investment in building new types of custom scale-up fabrics and, and the rest of the platform going custom to be able to, to really get as much of uh, this compute power available as possible, optimized and designed for your application. So it's, it's interesting though, because as you know, we, we pin it at something like 10% right now, XPU versus kind of the, the big GPU spend but it is converging, it's, it's closing in because right. the, the volume buying, the diversification, but when you talk about you know, the overall platforms, one of the big rate limiters, Chris, is going to be the network. So you're very focused on interconnect as right. well. Um, AI doesn't function all that well if you can't move the data quick enough. So you hear a lot about scale up, you hear a lot about scale out. Right. Um, Marvell has a pretty significant role to play there as well. I mean, right. how fast are you seeing, are you seeing the, the industry keep up from a, this space of connecting everything as we are spending time talking about doubling and tripling, you know, an exponential growth of compute power? On every one of these vectors, I continue to be amazed. You know, it, it, if, if you start in package, packaging today has achieved things that nobody's ever thought of before. Um, and ultimately being able to package the number of die and the size of these chip, it's hard to call them chips. These things are like, you know, six inches by six inches, these are huge packages. Yeah. And so that's one technology vector. The next technology vector is of course, how do you actually connect them together with the high speed copper interconnect? And there's tons of innovation there. Eventually you're gonna run out of space there and it's gonna to need to go optical. So we've made announcements around our, our, our co-packaged optic solutions to be able to build a any to any XPU fabric, all optically connected straight into the package. That's a new innovation that's coming as well. And of course, once you build out that rack and you have the rack scale platform, now you need to be able to go across the data center and build as many as you can there. And Marvell demonstrated the world's first 448 gig PAM4 um, optical connectivity at OFC a couple of months ago. Um, a few years ago, there was debate in the industry whether you could ever do 448. You know, in the technology industry, we sometimes think we'll never be able to go beyond this. There's some barrier coming. And I'm always amazed at the ingenuity of engineers to, to break through that barrier. And another one is the reach of PAM4. You know, these data centers are now getting so big that, that it's starting to hit the reach, the end of that. And so the between data center, the ZR space for data center interconnect is too high a power. The PAM is too short a distance. So Marvell announced the first coherent light solution that actually takes and combines parts of both technology that allows you to connect huge campus-wide data centers. So if you look at every one of these vectors, the race is on, the engineers are innovating, and the technology is moving at a pace uh, unlike anything we've ever seen. And it feels in, in some way, at least as I observe, is that Marvell is innovating in many, many vectors, but there's so much concentration right now on one. And so I think it's kind of important you know, for everyone out there to understand that you know, 
what you're doing in terms of connecting in the rack, connecting between the racks, connecting between the physical buildings, and then of course sites that are far apart, there's a lot of technology in there and there's a lot of TAM. Right. There's a lot of TAM that's accessible to you. One other thing that you know I think is super important, because I say well, kind of what are the rate limiters? It's it's the compute, it's the network, and it's the power. Um, yep. You know, copper's uh, has its place, but you know, over over distances and stuff, it becomes very power inefficient. Um, and by the way, GPUs can be very power inefficient. Um, you know, for certain use cases, they can be great. Uh, we're seeing exponential scales in some way, but there is also a reason that many companies want to design their own. They have right. a very specific workload in mind or se several workloads. They can build their own software. They can do these things. How is Marvell sort of thinking about addressing that? Because that seems like one of the biggest opportunities That's is right. sort of addressing the the power problem. And you know, while China might be happy to build coal fire plants to a week or whatever they're building in the U.S., you know, we're trying to build nuclear, but you're, I mean, that's like a decade out, Chris. Power, yeah. It's not going to happen that quickly. Yeah, ultimately, I mean, that, that that's what we wake up and think about every single day. You know, when you when you're building silicon, you tend to think about power performance and area, and area is cost. So it's like, how much is it going to cost? What's the performance of it, and how much power? And to the point you made earlier in terms of capital allocation, cost is almost not the discussion anymore. It's how much performance at what power is really the, all of the discussion that you can you can have right now. And ultimately, everything we're doing is focused on that. I mean, you mentioned custom earlier. That's exactly why custom. I mean, what, by the way, why are we doing AI work on GPUs instead of CPUs in the first place? Because they're more specialized to do this type of work. So if you can make a more specialized XPU or AI processor for a more specialized workload, it's going to be more power efficient, right? And same thing, if you can if you if you're addressing any possible application, you're going to build one type of a platform that sort of can deal with anything. But if you're saying no, I really I'm going to focus on this model or this application, you can build not only an optimized XPU, but an optimized platform that connects those together and optimizes the connections connections between XPUs and the connections to memory and the ratios of all of those for the way your data, your model is split and spread logically across that logical XPU. And so all of that has power and space in mind. I mean, cost is obviously an important one, but even more important is, hey, I, this is the space and power envelope that I have. What's the most optimal way to deploy infrastructure to attack my problem? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I actually think there is, a, at least at this point, you know, if the bubble bears, I like to call them, have anything to actually have a bubble about, it's that we have to turn all this infrastructure investment into consumption. Right. And, and and we're seeing it. But you know, these agentic workflows where you have trillions of concurrent right. 24 by seven agents, um, you know, and, and we are, by the way, also seeing a pivot that I think is very favorable to you, which is inference surpassing training. Right. Now, you guys can build a custom chip for training. You can build a custom trip for ch trip chip for inference, but the volume and inference is where the money is made. Right. Training is where you, it was basically the R and D of this industry that basically scaled the models, prepared the data, all the stuff that had to be done. So how does this work going sure. forward? Yeah, you know, you mentioned the you mentioned the tipping point and money to be made, turn all this infrastructure investment into, into dollars. And I, I find it interesting, you know, I started my career in mobile, right, where the world had 2G cellular networks and was just auctioning 3G spectrum and everybody was thinking about going with wireless and, and ultimately, there was you know billions and billions of dollars being built in sort of telecommunications network and cellular communications on top of the telecommunications networks um, around the world. And that question was asked constantly: Is anybody going to ever use 3G, 4G, 5G to do anything? And nobody could even imagine back then. We weren't even doing SMS text messages, and 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 there was a lot of questioning: Does this make any sense? The reality is, it took more than a decade of just pouring money into the infrastructure build out before all the blossoms bloomed, right? Sure. Before you actually had this massive mobile economy. It is the economy now, right? It's built on this, on this giant infrastructure that's been built. And b back then, nobody even knew we were gonna have, uh, you know, iPhone and Android. Nobody knew we were gonna have the App Store. Nobody knew we were gonna build, you know, all of these apps in the App Store that are making billions of dollars. Certainly didn't know about ChatGPT. They didn't know all the stuff <laughs> that was gonna come on the back of it. And I feel like the way we are with AI is in similar, we're pouring billions into the infrastructure to develop the platform, which will eventually lead to this massive economic explosion. But these things usually are decades. We're only like two years into this thing. Hey. I think that we don't, what, what are they gonna be? The app stores and the Androids and the iOSs and all of the other parts of the platform that's gonna lead to all this economic uh, value for the world. We don't even know it all yet, but 
it's definitely happening. Yeah, there's a lot of questions. And, and to be very clear, I'm not one of the, the, the bubble bear guys. I just meant that overall, that's been probably one of the questions mm -hmm. of how fast we're building infrastructure versus how quickly it's being consumed. And to your point, the fact that we actually have this many use cases, you know, you got CEOs of, uh, you got the Elon Musks and Sam Altman saying, my GPUs are melting. Like literally they have a use case that's consuming so much compute right now that they cannot get enough access. So we actually have some of these use cases. Right. It's in the wild right now, well ahead of the era where, you know, Steve Ballmer, and when he said, nobody's going to type from a touch screen, you know, there's right, some, right, been right. some fascinating, by the way, really smart people that made some fascinatingly wrong predictions in the past. I think we're going to get there. I think these are really exciting times. Chris, before I let you go, what is your sort of vision? You know, you kind of started alluding to it, but how, how fast does this accelerate? And how big do you see this custom opportunity? Um, so what we believe is, is that, I mean, first of all, take your numbers of how big you think the accelerated infrastructure market is going to be and how big the accelerated um, infrastructure um, TAM will be over the next, you know, three, four years even, right? The compute side alone should be close to $400 billion, somewhere in the sort of three to $400 billion by 2028. And what we've said is, is that we think a quarter of the market, you mentioned 10% now, um, we think it'll become a quarter of the market, whether that's in 2028, seven, eight or nine, but we're, we're, we believe that it's, it's on track. We said that a year ago, we said that again today, we think that that so is around on track to, to go custom. And ultimately, exactly, ultimately somewhere in that sort of 80 to $100 billion worth of custom um, opportunity. Yeah, it's a, it's a big number, it's a big opportunity. And like I said, I think one of the biggest things right now is we've kind of built this world where people kind of limit their purview. Everyone's obsessed with the compute, but this stuff does not work if right. you don't get the thermals right, you don't get the connectivity right, you don't get the, of course, compute right, you gotta have the data layer correct. Right. And then of course, we've gotta have the, the, the applications and the use cases. It's the whole platform and the infrastructure is actually uh, in some ways almost more important, really. And, and, it's, and, it's, and, and we're seeing that in terms of our, Design win we can't do any of it without without this base layer that you are helping to build. And so really appreciate that. And of course, the era of the humanoids and the fully autonomous vehicles, and we'll each have our own agent. And then you and I can, uh, we can play golf. We can go on, we can golf or go on a vacation and finally take a vacation. So <laughs> Chris, thanks so much for joining me here at the 6.5 Summit. It's great having you great uh, each year talking to, about what's going on. It's moving very quickly. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dan. Always a great conversation. And thank you everybody for being part of this 6.5 Summit 2025. We are AI Unleashed, the spotlight session with Chris Koopmans, COO of Marvell in the semiconductor track. Stick with us, check out 65media.com slash summit to get all the sessions, more insights coming after this.